Why are wildfires sometimes good for the ecosystem? Throughout the entire tree of life, fire is one of the very few true equalizers. Sufficient heat in a high oxygen environment will destroy anything carbon-based. In other words, that's all terrestrial life on Earth. You would think that hundreds of millions of years of evolution in the oxygenated atmosphere would have yielded a solution to fire, but the laws of evolution just aren't as powerful as the laws of chemistry. Sure, you can fill up your cells with water, but a fire that can quite possibly exceed a thousand degrees Celsius or 1800 hamburger degrees will quickly boil off all that water and rip you to shreds. Therefore, in the present day, where we live within and appreciate the services of terrestrial ecosystems, humans dedicate huge amounts of resources to combating wildland fires, and with good cause. This past summer of 2023 was Canada's worst fire season on record displacing thousands and casting smoke across Canada and the US. Australia's 2019-2020 bushfire season, as you may recall, devastated millions of acres, straight up drove some species to extinction, killed almost 100 people, and the smoke caused health problems for Australians across the country. Fires have always occurred in nature, generally as the result of a natural ignition like from a lightning or a volcanic eruption. As long as there have been carbon-rich fuels sitting around in an oxygen-rich atmosphere, there have been natural fires. That's most of the natural history of land plants. On the scale of an ecosystem, fire has always been an abiotic factor that living things have had to contend with, just like climate and soil's chemistry. These are powerful forces that living things cannot fight back against directly. They are forces that, unless living things adapt, will wipe them out. But that's the thing about life. It adapts. Generations of plants over hundreds of millions of years have been exposed to fire, and since actually insulating the individual organisms was off the table, many plants adapted to fire on a population level. If a fire burns through a plant population in a given range, there are going to be survivors. Some of them will survive just due to random chance, but some will survive because they have some trait about them that keeps their genes alive. The actual organism itself may or may not be destroyed, but the offspring are able to be passed off no matter what. This is the core of evolution. There is variation in the population, and when a number of individuals from the population are selected based on a trait that they have or do not have, the surviving offspring inherit that trait. Nothing new. And certainly there are some excellent case studies of organisms that have evolved traits for the express purpose of adapting to wildland fires. Take the humble eucalyptus. It's a super diverse group of trees and shrubs from Australia, the island of Papua, and a few other islands in Indonesia. These are hot and often dry climates, and Eucalyptus' evolutionary ancestors had to deal with fire all the time. But if fire, like we said, destroys everything, then how could Eucalyptus survive, let alone adapt? Well, it protects its seeds, not its body. As the parent tree withers away from a recent fire, their fruits, hard woody things that protect the seeds within, are cast off into the recently ravaged forest floor to germinate and continue the cycle of life. The fruits are sealed up within resin, a thick, waxy substance that doesn't burn, but melts in the heat of the fire. It would be impossible for the tree to coat its whole body in resin, but covering its tiny seeds? That's easy. This strategy works really well. After all, when a fire ravages a landscape, it basically wipes out everything. There is no competition for these seeds. They get all of the canopy-free sunlight and uncontested soil nutrients that they could eat. It works so well, in fact, that eucalyptus individuals want to start wildland fires and get burned to the ground. They evolved to be dry and oily and to be some of the most flammable things in the plant kingdom. Why? Because there is no evolutionary imperative for organisms to protect their somatic cells. That's the parts of the organism that aren't sex cells. Evolution doesn't care if a tree suffers a fiery death so long as the seeds get passed on intact. And yes, this principle applies to humans too. You don't have to live a long and healthy life, you just need to live long enough to get those sperms and eggs fused to make a baby. Don't think too hard about it. But there's so much more to the ecology of fire than just its relationship with populations of a very specific organism. Fire, after all, affects everything. The entire community and the entire ecosystem. Consider litter. Not human litter, but plant litter. Plants are organisms, and like all organisms, they produce waste. As trees grow, they shed off their branches, and they accrue on the forest floor. And yeah, they'll decompose, but the process that integrates organic matter into soil happens over a very, very long time. That litter will just continue to build up, dry, dense, well-ventilated carbon-based fuel that are just begging to catch fire. If enough litter piles up over time, it will burn very hot, 
and potentially bring the ecosystem to its knees. But if the fire starts while the litter isn't that abundant, the fire won't be that intense. Instead, the fire will purge out the litter, depositing the minerals of the ash into the soil and clearing up much of the understory, effectively resetting the ecosystem. Fires, in healthy quantities and intensities, don't ruin ecosystems. They regulate ecosystems, dealing with waste and encouraging continued competition among organisms. And small fires actually work to prevent larger fires. Frequent purging of flammable litter keeps it from piling up too high, which would set the scene for a huge fire. This creates a natural cycle, incorporating the fire not as an enemy of the ecosystem, but a part of it. So while the fuss about fire, well, just because plants can handle small intensity fires, us animals don't necessarily fare as well. While birds and mammals can flee from a burning forest or burrow into the damp ground, humans have a tendency to build houses and grow crops and extract resources from forests and grasslands. Wildland fires are a serious problem for humans, not just for safety reasons, but also economic reasons. A fire can make a forest unusable to loggers, tear through a field of crops, or destroy an entire town without skipping a beat. Humans have been trying to figure out ways to control and manage wildland fire for a very long time. Indigenous peoples in North America worked out thousands of years ago that small controlled burns can prevent larger ones, but historically, national level fire management in Canada, the US, and Australia was about observation, land use, and prevention. Modern governments have only recently embraced the idea of controlled burns, which has proven very effective in preventing larger fires. But still, larger fires burn. Much larger fires. The reality is that, no matter how effectively you manage your land, hot seasons that are getting hotter and hotter will result in fires anyways. Climate change is happening now, and our forests and grasslands are the parts of the biosphere that are feeling some of the most destructive initial effects. These ecosystems represent a huge amount of sequestered carbon that, when burned, creates a runaway cycle whereby more fires emit more carbon, which in turn warms the climate and causes more fires. Living things and their relationship with non-living things are complicated. We were naive to think that fire is an out and out bad thing for ecosystems, and perhaps we are still naive to believe that land management and controlled burns are enough to harness fires completely. But in the age of global change, we have to get better at understanding the relationship between fires, ecology, climate, and humans. And the more we learn about fire, the more we can do to adapt to it while we work on solutions to the climate crisis as a whole. I'm Philip Parker, and this is Ecologically.